So we're going to start a series on the prophecy of Jesus Christ. And this is going to bring you great joy. This is going to bring you great peace. I mean, this is, this is going to bless you. I, I know we look around us and we get a little uptight uh, with things that are happening. But listen, fear not. It's okay. God's still in control. He's got a plan. It's a good plan. He loves you. He's going to take care of you. You just got to see it and believe it. So hopefully today in the message, you'll get a better revelation of, of what's going on and that it's okay. God already knows. Uh, it lines up a lot of it with Scripture. And it's, it's, it's good. God is good all the time, right? All the time. All the time. Um, if, you're, if, that, if the fear is getting to you, just listen, you have authority over it. You have authority over fear. Fear is a spirit. You've got authority. You've got the Holy Spirit. You can speak to that fear and say, I rebuke you. I will not fear. I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Fear, get out of here. You're under my feet. And step on that fear. It's a little snaky demon, man. I just want you to be afraid. But you can crush his little head. Come on, your words are so powerful. See and understand who you are in Jesus Christ and the authority that you have. You have authority over the, all the demonic realm. Luke 10, uh, 19 says, Behold, I give you authority uh, to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means will hurt you, will harm you. You got authority over those lion demons. See that. Okay, so starting off right away, we're going to start in the very beginning of the book of Revelation. And we're, it's, this isn't going to be like a, a line upon line going through Revelation. We'll, we'll look at some things. We'll pull some things out. We'll go into other scriptures because it's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And this is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. This whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. It's Jesus, Jesus, and more Jesus. It starts with Jesus in the middle. G, uh, or Jesus in the beginning, G Jesus in the middle, and Jesus at the end. So, you know, sometimes uh, it's so sad because I know, I, I know a lot of people. I'm getting to meet more people with the new circle that I'm moving in. God's brought me into. And there's a lot of people that believe in God and, and believe that there's Jesus, and Jesus is good and everything, but, but they don't look at Jesus as the Savior of everything, as the God and the Lord of everything, it's like, he's good, and he did this, and that's one way, but, you know, there are other, other ways, but, you know, and they're, and they're trying to draw in other ways and other avenues and other sources of power and energy and different things um, without the one who is the, 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 the power source is Jesus. So I, I, I get concerned that there are even, this, this philosophy has invaded our church as well. And I even talk to people who come here who kind of get, confused about who Jesus really is. I mean, they, they know he died for our sins and, and he's our savior and everything, but they still feel, well, there's just a little more though. There's a little more to what's going on in the world that way and Jesus and all the spiritual stuff other than, than just Jesus. Uh, there, it, it, yeah, but there's still the one with all the power is Jesus. You know, we, we got to get that into our heart. Everything, our, our life, it's, it's about Jesus Christ. Okay. So Revelation 1, 1 through 3, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, which God gave him, Jesus, to show his servants, that's us, things which must shortly take place. So right away it's saying, look, we're going to show you what's going to take place. So that way you know how to handle it and you're not worried. Opening statement in the book of Revelation. We're going to show you what's going on so you're not going to worry about it. And it's going to look all crazy and hairy, but it's okay. Okay, so the revelation of Jesus Christ. You got the revelation of Jesus, you're good. Which God gave to him. God gave this all to Jesus, so Jesus then could give it to us. To show that Jesus is that. God gave all that authority to Jesus Christ. To show his servants, us, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. So Jesus also is working with the angels. Jesus is working and directing and commanding the angels. The angels wait for us to pray and release the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The angels work with Jesus Christ. So when you speak and release the word of God, it's the authority of Jesus Christ to release the angels, to go and war on our behalf. You're not alone. Not only do you have Jesus there, the Holy Spirit there, there are angels on assignment that are working with us as well. Isn't it great to know? I mean, I love it. We have all this on our side if we'll just see it and step into what's going on. 
And he sent and signified it by his angels to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God. It's all about the word of God. And to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So it's saying, look, you're blessed. You're blessed if, if you read, you got to read it. it they, they want us to read this like we're doing today. And we read some things from Revelation. You're, you're to read Revelation. Well, I don't understand it. Hey, there's nobody that completely understands it, okay? I don't completely understand it. And if anybody thinks they completely understand Revelation and they tell you that, they're wrong. Because nobody does. All the mysteries that are in that aren't going to be revealed until the, the last trump, until the seventh trump. And then all this stuff is going to make sense. But until then, we're just seeing bits and pieces. So don't get hung up on it. But you are still to read it. He'll show you some things. This is what, this is what you're going to see in Revelation. What you need to see to have victory. What do you need in your life? What do you need to apply? What do you need to get through the next challenge that you're facing or something that's happening around you? That's what the Lord wants to show you, to direct you. This word is a lamp unto your feet, to direct you through the times when they get dark. Just shine your Bible. This is the light. Oh, it's getting dark. Things are getting crazy. What do I do? Oh, shine the Bible. Woo, what's the word of God say? And release the word of God. Okay? You have to keep the things that are in this. You have to read, you have to hear. I mean, you've got to understand it and, and, and take it into your heart, that prophetic word of things that are coming, and keep it, hold on to it. The enemy's a liar, and he wants to steal your peace. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your blessings. He wants to wreck your life. He wants to get you into all kinds of trouble. And Man, and, and we, can't, we can't let him take us there. You know, like I say, when you think of tribulation, does fear come in or, or does, I'm blessed. It's all good. God knows what's going on. It's going to be exciting. And I'm not a masochist. <laughs> you might think, you know, Mike, you're excited about what's going on? Yeah, because Jesus is coming. Come on. He said all these things are going to come to pass, and he's good. I love him. I'm crazy about him. It's all good. It's going to give an opportunity to, to reach out and try to help some people and because they're going to be confused, uh, they're going to be distracted, they're going to be in fear, and you have the answer. You've got authority. You've got power to pray for them and bring peace into their life. You release peace. You've got the peace of God. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, he's in you. He's your Lord, and you have that authority. So when somebody is smacked out, whacked out, going crazy, you could just say, L let me pray for you. And all you got to do is say, I call for peace in your life. I command peace to be in your life. That's simple. That's simple. And you just now release the peace of God into that person and believe it. And it will flow through you. It will flow through you. Or what about you? If you're all stressed out and saying, and you're just saying, Peace in Jesus' name. Lay hands on your own forehood and command peace. I'm telling you, I've done it. I have. Because I believe in the word. I don't got somebody there to lay hands on me. I'll lay hands on me. I just smashed my thumb the other day, and I laid hands on it right away and said, you are healed. I got too much work to do. You cannot be smashed. I rebuke you, pain. I got to finish splitting all this wood. I was splitting wood. And you are healed, and that swelling has gone down, and God is good, and Holy Spirit Renew this thumb in Jesus' name. And I just kept going. And there's not even, a, not even much of a mark there anymore. God is good. Come on. Um, all right, see, so you just got me all fired up about the things of God. So what, what we've always done at, at, at Lifesong Church, we've always taken the Word of God. From, from, we've been doing this for 20 years. We take the Word of God, and how do we make it applicable how do we make it relevant to the world around us and what's happening? Um, it has to become life in our life. Um, it, it's just not another good Bible story of what happened to people a long time ago. No, it's giving you lessons and understanding of how you can apply this now so you can do the same miracles and do the same things of all the people that have done this in the Bible in the past. 
Because the, the, the Bible, the, the Bible is complete, but it's not completely fulfilled. Ooh, that's good. Did you get that? This is complete. You can't add anything to it. But everything in it isn't fulfilled. Revelation is not fulfilled yet. It's not done. We didn't walk it out. Jesus hasn't come back. So it's complete, but it's not completely fulfilled. Why? Because all of us have a life to live yet, which is adding to all the things of God and fulfilling the prophecy. We are fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing. Okay, so now, so we've always preached and taught this way. Now, let's, let's pop into Revelation, the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation 6, 5 through 6. Now, the first thing it starts off with after it talks about the, the seven churches and what the word of the Lord says to the seven churches, uh, then they, they talk about what's happening in the throne room around God, and then they say, you know, the lamb is worthy to take the, the, the scroll and break all the seals on the scroll. So there's this scroll. It's got seven seals on it. Seven wax seals is what it traditionally would be, and you have to have authority, even it was in the days of the scrolls and the days of the king, because we look at the physical, which is a reflection of the spiritual, so we can understand what's happening spiritually. And so in the throne room of heaven, there's a scroll, seven seals, and you have to have authority to, to open a seal. And this had to have a specific authority because there were seven seals. Each one took a different authority to open, but Jesus Christ had all the authority, so Jesus Christ was the only one who could open all seven seals. And so when he opens up the scroll, basically what the scroll is, is it's telling us what's going to come. It's like the judgment of God. The, these are the things that are going to come to pass. But we don't have to worry about the judgment of God because we've already been judged. And, and this is your verdict. Not guilty! If you've given your life to Jesus Christ and you believe in him, okay, then the cross took away your sins. You've already been judged. You've been judged by the blood. And your sin's gone. And so God says, if you've given your life and you're saved, the verdict is not guilty. So the judgment that's going to come is not upon you. But if it's happening around us, we still have to deal with it. But God will give us what we need to deal with it because we're his kids and he loves us. So here's, here's the third seal. This is what's happening now. I want you to see this. It's called scarcity on earth. When he opened up the third seal, this is the scripture. I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. The third seal is not about worldwide famine. If you think, okay, if we're looking in Revelation and what's going on in the world today, and if this is actually playing out, we're not 100% sure if this is it or how it's going to play out, but we can have understanding from this and look at the paradigms, the parallels of God. And with this, the, the, the third seal is not worldwide famine. It's scarcity and it's hyperinflation. It's hyperinflation because they said that you're, this, this little bit of, of, of barley and grain and everything, it's going to cost a denarii. Well, a denarii is a day's wage. That's what, you know, so an average day's, day's wage of a laborer, of a worker. So you take what? Uh, $15 an hour times eight hours and whatever that is. And, that's, and, and what that basically is, is almost like a loaf of bread. It's there and it's scarce, but they're still there. And it's going to cost a whole lot. It's scarcity and hyperinflation. Okay? Now, the end times with wisdom and, and preparation. I want, I want you to see this. We want to take the spiritual. How do we take the spiritual and walk by faith, live by faith, understand the authority that we have? But also we got to be practical. we got to have practical wisdom of how to walk things out. If you're just always all faithy and you don't do anything practical, you're like a little fruit loop, little, I don't know, a little too fruity, I think, sometimes. And Yeah, I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're so spiritual, you're no earthly good. You know, we have to have some practical understanding of how do we apply this practically. 
We are experiencing shortages right now of basic supplies and food items. I don't know if you realize that, and it's going to get worse. Uh, Carrie uh, orders all of our supplies here, and she just talked to me on Monday, and she said, hey, if we're running out of nine-inch plates and different supplies around the church, she goes, I want you to know it's not because I'm uh, slacking on my job. It's because I can't get it. There, it's not out there. No, the suppliers don't have it. Well, and this is going to increase. I, I believe it's going to get worse before it gets better because look at the scenario. We've got wisdom of what's happening spiritually and in the natural. Put them together. This is due to a breakdown in our distribution system caused by COVID-related issues. Almost all of this ties back to COVID. I believe this is an intentional shortage, shortage caused by the deep state manipulating this pandemic. And I can go in and explain this. I don't have time to give you all the details. Right now, this is what we know. Over 60 cargo container ships are waiting off the coast of California and several more on the East Coast. These container ships are huge. They're monstrous. You know, those big containers, they have hundreds of those big containers on them that they offload with all kinds of product. Now, so now this, now this complicates it. 150 more ships are waiting to load in China and Asia. So over twice as many that are waiting here to unload are waiting to load to get the product to come here with the product. So it's not just that our ships out here are waiting to unload. The ones that are going to bring the next shipment of stuff haven't been loaded yet. Kind of like the Bible being walked out. Now, now follow me. If Congress passes the $1.4 trillion spending bill, followed by another $3 trillion plus uh, dollar infrastructure bill, it'll cause great inflation. When they pass these things, it's not like we got $1.4 trillion in the bank or $3 trillion. We don't have that money. We just print more dollar bills. We just print more money. And so what does that mean then? When you just print more money, it means what you have, by, it's less valuable. It's less valuable. Right, it's like a baseball card. That's good. Good, thanks, Nate. I just heard him say that. It's like, it's like a, a baseball card, too, where they're, if, there's, you know, if, if they made 500 of this one player, they're not very valuable. But if they only made like 100 of this one player and the player is really good, whatever, it, it makes it more valuable. You did, but you flood the market with that. It's just not, it, 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 it loses the, the, the buying power. It loses its value. And that's when inflation hits. That's called inflation where it, it, this money just doesn't buy as much as what it used to. And you've been noticing that, but it's just going to get worse. And then you take the lack of product because of the shipping distribution, the COVID stuff, plus inf inflation, plus panic buying. Now you have hyperinflation. Now you have Venezuela. I don't know if any of you know history. They don't like us to follow history. Uh, Venezuela was one of the most prosperous uh, nations in uh, South America. They were capitalists, had a democracy, and then all of a sudden, communism came in there, took over, and now the inflation is nuts. It went up over, I don't know how many thousand percent, where basically the, the paper money there uh, was more valuable as toilet paper than it was as money. It was, it's just horrible. It is horrendous what happened there. That's what happens when socialistic communism comes in and takes over. And that's the path we're on. That is the path. We, if you can't see it, I'm, <laughs> open up your eyes for goodness sake. You can't spell it out any more plain. We've been warning people for years here at Lifesong Church to have enough food and water supplies on hand for at least 30 days. What would you do if you, you couldn't go to the store uh, and the electricity was out? Could you survive for 30 days? Do you have enough basic supplies, food, water, toilet paper, things, whatever you need, uh, and a way to stay warm or, or a, little, a little portable solar panel, something, uh, a way to get water? I mean, could you survive for 30 days? And, and there's all kinds of scenarios that can bring that up. Uh, not, not just uh, because of what we're going into right now, but there's all kinds of scenarios. I mean, if a solar flare goes off and, and takes off, knocks out our our satellite and our communication and, and that uh, uh, electrical magnetic pulse, that would take out our, our whole system, which would, we'd lose electricity and distribution and everything. So even the sun could cause this problem. But, so we always say it's just good to be prepared. That's being functional, practical. That doesn't mean you, you lack faith. No, God gives us wisdom, said be prepared. Don't keep all your money in the bank. Keep some cash on hand and turn some of your cash into silver and gold. That's what I would recommend. 
You don't have to do that. You've got to listen to the Holy Spirit. But this is what a lot of people who know this and have studied this for years, this is what they've done. This is how they prepare. So when these things do happen, you're doing okay. All of a sudden, when this inflation and, or, or this, uh, this crazy thing, then all of a sudden, too, the, the bottom, we can implode financially. Then what happens is you wake up. This is what happened in Venezuela. Happened in Russia. Happened in a lot of places. All of a sudden, you wake up the next day, and all the bank accounts are frozen. And you can't even get your money out. And everything that you do have is worth way less. Pennies on the dollar. And then they only say, well, you can only get so much cash out every day of what you have, and the money that you have isn't worth what it was. That's why we say it's good to have cash on hand. It's good to have some silver on hand. Even, I mean, gold, if you can afford some of it, um, because that's going to that's maintain its value. That, that basically has been uh, a traditional. Um, and again, this isn't fear, but it's wisdom with practical preparation. Jesus told us to watch and be ready for his return, because Jesus said, before I come back, it's going to get crazy, but it's okay. It's okay. I got you. Okay? And 2 Kings, oh, man. Okay, I'll explain. 2 Kings 4, 1 through 17 was about Elijah. We talked about the double portion last week. If you were here, we prayed and believed and released the double portion, that anointing of God's authority to see us through, to give us faith, to give us hope, because we can't do this on our own. We want that double portion of his anointing and one of the things that uh, uh, Elijah did, E2, with this double portion that he had, um, there was a widow, uh, and times were tough, times were tough. And this uh, uh, widow, her husband was in the ministry. Um, I believe he was one of the prophets. And so when, uh, and then she was falling on hard financial times. And she had two sons, and she was in debt, and the debtors said, we're coming to take your sons because we're going to sell them as slaves. When you're in debt, back then, they didn't mess around. Mess around. You didn't get to claim bankruptcy, okay? You, you really didn't want to get in debt. And so um, she cries out to Elijah. And Elijah said, this is a good principle, said, what do you have? What do you have? And she said, all I have is a little oil in a jar. He's like, great, that'll do it. He said, Go out, get all the vessels you can, get all the containers you can get, gather them all together, bring them in here. So they went and asked the neighbors, they did everything they could, they got all the, all the containers together, and then they took that little jar of oil and he said, now fill up all your containers. She could have said, you're nuts, that ain't never going to work and not do it. She wouldn't have got anything other than her little oil. But she's okay, man of God said this, I'm going to start pouring. Starts pouring and It filled up every container in the house. And then once the last container was full, the little jar ran out. And then he said to her, go take the oil, pay your debt, and then with the rest of it, you live off this. So not only was there enough to pay the debt, there was enough now to live for her and her, her, and her family. Because God wants to give us more than enough if we're going to be faithful and obedient to him. He wants to give you. So oil is symbolic of provision. All throughout the Old Testament and the New, we can see that's one spiritual application of oil is provision. And in uh, 2 Kings, it talks about the bread. Another miracle that Elisha, E2, what he did, um, they, uh, a man brought, um, he was with all the, the, the troops there, all the soldiers, uh, I think there was a hundred of them. And, uh, a guy brought um, just uh, a few barley loaves uh, and um, I don't know, some grain or something else like that. And he said, here, you know, I got this to, uh, for you if you want to help, whatever. And, and, and he said, well, we're going to give it to the men. And the guy goes, what? Like, this, there's not enough here to feed the, all these guys. This is ridiculous. Because the loaves of bread aren't that big. You know, one guy polish off five of those little barley loaves, you know, and there's a hundred of them here. And, and Elijah knew the word. He said, no, the Lord said there will be more than enough and there'll be some left over. He said, so start passing it out. Who else did that? Jesus. Jesus did that in the New Testament. Here's Elijah. He's a person like us. But he knew the authority that he had through the Word of God. One of the times when Jesus took the loaves of fish and, and, and the, what, the few, five bread or whatever, and he said, he said you know, okay. Um, they said, you know, Jesus, there's a bunch of people here. It's late. They're hungry. They're tired. Uh, you know, uh, it's getting late to send them to the village. They wouldn't even have enough food for them. And, 
Uh, we don't know what we're going to do, whatever. They're hungry. And Jesus looks at him and goes, you feed them. And I could see those guys right away, like, they're like, what? What's he saying? I could see, I, did you hear what he said? Ah, we're supposed to, what are we going to do? I don't know. What are you going to, I don't know. You know? And Jesus, okay, like, you know, okay, okay, guys, calm down. Just, this is what you're going to do. Tell them all to sit down, bless it, start, break it. There'll be enough. But Jesus is trying to say, look, I want you to walk. I'm going to do the miracle, but I'm going to do it through you. Elijah didn't have any power to make the, the oil come out of that jar. God did. But because he believed in the word of God, God used him. Because he knew. Okay? So this is the spiritual aspect of all this that's going on. So it's not only practical, you know, get some stuff, have some water, have some extra food, have some supplies, have, do feel, pray, do what you get, what the Lord tells you to get. That's the practical. And then the spiritual is, okay, even though I have a little bit, it might not be enough, but I have a little bit because I've been faithful to get a little bit. Now I know what's going to happen if it does get rough. I can pray over this little bit that I have and I want to, have faith and also get so if somebody asks me for some food and i think i don't have enough all i got to do is pray over the food that i have and i'll give a little bit of that food away but i know god will multiply the food that i have and it'll last as long as i listen that's faith and if you don't have that kind of faith you, you better get a whole bunch of food i mean it's good to have food on hand in case whatever but it's it's good to pray and believe that there were times, there were times, as you guys know, I was a culinary arts instructor at the Sandlack Career Center, and we used to feed the staff lunch every day. And there were times where I know we did not have enough food to complete the meal. I know it because we got so many meals, and something happened, something got burnt, something didn't go right, we had to substitute something. But I'm like, okay, Karen and I would pray, Lord, you've always been faithful. I pray somehow we make it with this, you know, show me how to do whatever, but Lord, I pray that we're going to have enough food to feed everybody today. We're not going to run out. And we always would get through the list. Why? Because I just believe in the Word of God every day. I mean, it's just life. It's just pray and believe in every, and, and everything. Now, was it just my mind uh, making smaller portions and trying to divide things up or whatever? I, I don't know. Could have had something to do with it. But I, the, the fact is, it's my faith. Okay, God, help me here. That's the faith that God wants us to all have. Spiritual oil. Now, spiritual oil. Spiritual oil. This is how we get fresh spiritual oil. Spiritual oil comes from ministering to our Lord because you want spiritual oil. Not only the physical, practical stuff, but spiritual oil comes from ministering to our Lord and spending time praising Him, praying, giving, reading the Word, corporate worship, the joy of serving others. We don't earn spiritual oil. It's a byproduct of spending time with our Lord Jesus Christ and walking in His ways. Oil is a byproduct of unity and humility. Every Sunday when you come, if you come expecting, you're receiving fresh oil. That's the anointing. That's the provision. That's the faith. That's the authority. It says fresh oil. That means it's something new. You should come every Sunday so you not only have oil, fresh oil, in your vessel, but in a separate container. You want to believe that your separate container, which is a, a horn. They used to carry uh, oil in a horn, a hollowed out, like a ram's horn, and they would seal it up. And horn is symbolic of authority. And they would carry extra oil in that. And with that, I want to just read really quick about the wise and foolish virgins. There were ten virgins. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven, and, and Jesus just got done talking about the end times in chapter 24, Matthew. Now we're going into chapter 25, so he's still kind of wrapping up the end times together. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. They had enough in their vessel. But they didn't have any extra. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So they also had a secondary vessel which they filled with oil. And again, I told you how spiritual oil comes. Physical oil is symbolic of provision. You know that. 
So let's look at the practical and let's look at the spiritual. The foolish took no oil with them. Their provision and preparation was limited. That's in the, in the physical. In today's language, they basically live from paycheck to paycheck. Um, and some people are very limited with their income and ability to work, but everyone's called to be a good steward. You, there are some people in this church that don't make that much, but if you looked at them, you would think that they're wildly blessed financially. No, they're just good stewards. And they do the best they can to be that good steward. So we have more than enough. But it's through faith. It's through the principles of God. It's through applying his financial understanding to our world today. It's practical. And again, so the spiritual application is the foolish version spent very little time with the Lord and in his word and serving people. But the bridegroom was delayed. So now back into scripture. But the bridegroom was delayed. And all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. The bridegroom was delayed. And it's dark. It's midnight. It, it, this is symbolic of, okay, it's dark. Things are looking dark. Things aren't looking so good. Jesus is supposed to be here by now. Uh, kind of some stuff is happening. Breaking loose here. It's like, okay, Jesus, where are you? It's getting really rough. He's delayed. Where, where are you? And, and, and he's not here. But those of us who are prepared and are ready and got extra oil, it's like, eh, ain't no big deal. He'll get here when he gets here. It's all good in the meantime. But if you don't have a lot of that extra oil, and all of a sudden it's looking bad, it's looking rough, and you think, oh, man, we should have been raptured out of here by now. This is really crazy. This world's going nuts. Where is Jesus? He should have been here. And you start to panic because you don't have that extra oil. Because he was delayed, and the bridegroom was delayed. And it was at midnight when that cry was heard, in the middle of the night where it's getting dark. He's coming. You know, the foolish thought he had come right away without delay. And sometimes I wonder, now I'm just going to ask you this. This is just how my mind thinks. The foolish didn't prepare any extra because they thought the bridegroom Jesus was coming right away. I wonder if there are people that are Christians that won't prepare for any troubling times because they think that pre-trib, that Jesus is going to come before any bad or hard stuff comes and he's going to rapture us out of here, so I don't have to get ready for any of that. But then Jesus delayed his coming, and it was dark all around. Then all the virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and said, No, at least there should not be enough for you and for us. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. So now think. It's dark. Can't see. They've got no, no oil in their lamp. It's gone out there. And now they've got to go journey in the dark to go try to find and buy some oil. Not a good time to be going after some oil. And you think, oh, those, those mean wise virgins. If the wise virgins were really Christian and nice, they would have gave them some of their oil. I mean, they're not very Christ-like, are they? No, you're, you're, you're missing the point here. It's about preparation. It's about us being prepared. It's about you can't depend on the other person. With what's coming up, it's you and Jesus. Everything is you and Jesus. You and Jesus. Not your spouse and Jesus. Not your mom and dad and Jesus. Not your kids and Jesus. Not your bank account. Not any of that. It's, it's you and Jesus. And if you look and think you're going to depend on all those people around you, you're in a bad shape. That's what the, the, the point of this story is. It's you and Jesus and you being prepared with Jesus. And not looking to someone else to bail you out. Now, the good news is, as the church, and we love each other, and we're walking in unity, we're there for each other, we're there for one another, we're going to do what we can, right? Because if you're really filled with uh, presence and all that joy and oil of God, when someone asks you, you're going to pray, you're going to have enough, because you're going to take what you have, you're going to give some. You're going to pray, okay? 
But this is the parable of the ten virgins. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready, who were prepared, who were focused on Jesus, went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. And then Jesus said, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And so we think, okay, so the five foolish, does that mean they went to hell? Does that mean that it was all over for them? It's hard to say. I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, some people say, yeah, the door was shut. They didn't go in. And some people say, but if they were saved, aren't they the church? Doesn't that just mean maybe they just went through some harder times? Some people say that, well, the, the ones who were ready were raptured out. But the ones who weren't tro totally dedicated and focused on Jesus had to stay behind and still fight harder for their salvation. Because they got it, they were saved. They were already saved. But their heart wasn't right with the Lord. They, they, they weren't totally committed. They did not let go of the ways of this world. They were still holding on to the ways of the world. And if you're still holding on to the ways of the world and not completely trusting in Jesus Christ, are you really saved? Debatable. But you know what I'd say? Just make sure your heart's right and it's all good. <laughs> you don't want to be one of the five foolish, right? That's, that's the parable, that's, that's the, the purpose of the story. So you're not one of the five foolish. Don't put yourself in that situation to have to find out. Okay? Just be one of the wise. Be prepared. Be ready. God is all good. Oh, and listen to me. Oh, jeez. Doggone it. I got it. Just last thing. Last thing. Oh, jeez. Now, man, the most important part of this whole thing. Okay. Last thing I'm going to tell you. You know how I started off with the third seal? Uh, in Revelations 6, 5 through 6. And I'm going to tell you, in the Word of God, it looks like things can be kind of scary. It's dark. We don't know what to do. Things are breaking loose. But in it, there's always the promise and the security of God. And in this right here, too, listen, I'm just real quick because I'm going to explain this next week. So you got to come next week. In this, there's a huge promise. It says, okay, so when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse. And he who sat upon him had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Then now listen, here's the promise. Here's the really cool part. Oh boy, when you get a revelation of what this means, <laughs> man, it's going to just reverberate all through you. Listen, listen. And he, he wraps it up with, and do not harm the oil or the wine. If you know what that means spiritually, it's all good. You're all set. Because we're going to talk about this and what this means. But you got to come next week.